Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Matt Cockrell, senior hardware engineer with the Consumer Hardware Group at Google. Um, I don't have any updates on Spectre Meltdown today. That's not my department. But I'm excited to talk to you today about um, our evaluation of a RISC-V core for Pixel Visual Core. Um, we hope the RISC-V community finds this useful feedback on integrating some open source IP into a, a product. OK. Uh, so we're going to go through um, a few things. Uh, we'll, we'll describe the use case, um, how the core fit into Pixel Visual Core, and what its function was. And the next, we'll go through um, a process of selection from the available open source cores. And then we'll finish up with some notes on our integration experience and, and what we did. So a bit of a background. Um, Google's Pixel 2 mobile phone, if any of you have one, um, have a Pixel Visual Core in it. The Pixel Visual Core is a Google Design image processing unit, a fully programmable domain-specific processor designed from scratch to deliver maximum performance at low power. You can see the um, Pixel Visual Core uh, up here. You see the eight IPU cores with some surrounding IP, and in particular, the A53. Um, the A53 is dedicated to aggregating all of the application layer IPU resource requests and configures the cores appropriately. So for instance, if a user of the phone wanted to capture some image in HDR+, the A53 would configure the cores, and the image would be captured and transformed into HDR+ format. This is kind of a high-level bus diagram of Pixel Visual Core as it is today. You have a main CPU that's dedicated to running just an OS and just supports uh, the IPU. If we move forward to a modern SOC, you're going to have multiple accelerators, multiple devices on the bus. And no longer is that main CPU dedicated to just configuring the IPU. So we need to add some level of local control. Um, we're investigating adding a microcontroller as a job scheduling and dispatch unit. This is similar to what you see in um, GPUs, where you have a microcontroller as the outward facing component of the system as a slave on the bus or, and can, share, uh, can communicate with the rest of the system through constructs short, stored and shared memory. Um, the interesting thing here is the first thing you think of is just an M-class device, license it, and put it in there. But open source hardware provides an interesting option here. When we add some third-party IP into the IPU, then it makes it difficult to move throughout different products within Google. But if we can leverage some open source IP with a permissive license, then we can easily move that back and forth, and that alleviates the licensing issues. Also, we were able to, we, we were willing to absorb some risk here. The, firmware running on this microcontroller will be internally developed. It'll just be some bare metal firmware. So if we do encounter any issues with the open source hardware, we can work around them with some you know, compiler changes or some firmware workarounds. So there's an increasing number of RISC-V open cores available, um, both from academia, um, some eager hobbyists. Um, and as we started to look at those, we could see that we're going to have to define some considerations. So the first one we looked at was, when we look at the core, we look at the level of effort. How difficult would it be to work with and integrate? And at some point, if we choose to move forward with this core, there's a good chance we're going to be doing a fair bit of maintenance on it as well. So we want to make sure it's, it's in a good state. Next is risk. What kind of risk do we incur if we take this core and we integrate it with a verified piece of IP? We need to understand how stable it was and could we rely on any support from the actual provider? And kind of a qualifying consideration we looked at was the license. How flexible was the license? Um, we need to be able to take the RTL, integrate it without any obligation to provide uh, audit or share with any changes we made or share any RTL with anything that it's touching. Preferably an Apache 2.0-like license um, would be the best. Uh, anything that looked like GPL, just we, we couldn't even consider. So the first candidate we looked at was Bottle Rocket. Um, Bottle Rocket was an internal Google project, and it was actually presented a few workshops ago. And it demonstrates the ability to easily develop a custom RISC core uh, by leveraging portions of Rocket Chip. This particular core implements the RV32IMC. Um, and the main idea behind it is we take Rocket Chip and we generate the main portions of the core or the pipeline, and then we use some system Verilog around that to uh, wrap it all together and create the core. Um, this is what we, we consider our representation of evaluating Rocket Chip at the time. The next candidate we looked at was Merlin. Um, this core is provided from a hobbyist um, developed with the compatible Kubeflow. That hobbyist is here, Tom. Tom, Tom. how you doing? Uh, so this particular core implements, uh, sorry, it should be RV32IC. And when we looked at this core, um, we, 
we knew that if we ended up moving forward with it, we'd have to probably pull it in internally, and we would augment some of the effort to develop the core with some internal resources. So at the end of the day, it would have become like the build from scratch candidate, where we would build our own core for use. Next is Risky from Pulpino. Um, that's gotten quite a few mentions throughout the past couple of days here. Um, this is provided from the Pulp team, um, and they've done a very good job with it. Uh, it implements the RV32 IMC, and it has some added extensions that come with it. Um, this was a candidate we looked at, and it, it really kind of represented what was available in academia. So this chart represents our comparison at the end of the day. Um, so Bottle Rocket, we considered to have a level of effort of high. Um, the main reason for that is the Albert Magnar, the uh, PhD student we had come in to build this for us, he came from Berkeley. So he was quite familiar with Scala and Chisel and Rocket Chip. The rest of the people on our team, however, were not. And so we knew that if we took this on, there would be you know, some fundamental issues there. The risk we consider medium. Uh, Rocket Chip's been extensively used and tested. And so we didn't associate a lot of risk with that. Um, and Bottle Rocket itself is released under Apache 2.0 license, and so is Rocket Chip. And so that checked the license box for us. Uh, Merlin, we considered a low level of effort. Since Tom is on our team, we knew that if we chose to go this route, he has intimate knowledge of the design. And we could pull him in, and he would do a fair bit of the integration. If we had any issues, we could just go ask Tom. Um, the risk, however, was high. Tom would probably disagree with me. He did a really good job writing the RTL. It's high quality stuff. But this would be the first time this core would be utilized. And we would have to do a fair bit of the testing ourselves. When we look, uh, uh, Tom has uh, offered this particular core under the Apache 2.0 license. Uh, finally, Risky. Risky, we consider a low level of effort. Um, it's in system bear log, which our team is very familiar with, and it fits well into our flows. Uh, it comes with some clear and concise documentation. And we didn't think it would be a huge task to implement it, to integrate it into Pixel Visual Core. Uh, the risk was medium. Uh, you know, it, it seems that the Risky had had some extensive use at the time we were evaluating. Um, so, and there was some self-checking tests, and so it looked like it was a working core, so we didn't think there would be a lot of risk of integrating that. And that is offered under the solder pad license, which is, for the, those of you who don't know, it's, it's similar to Apache 2.0 with some added context for hardware. So at the end of the day, we chose to move forward with evaluating the uh, risky core from Pulp, and we did so for the various reasons. Uh, one, it had been taped out in a few chips, and for our group, that represented a level of maturity that helped alleviate some of our concerns of working with you know, some of the open source hardware that we'd seen that had not gotten that far. Um, the provided infrastructure, uh, some team members of ours, uh, we downloaded the, the RTL, um, played with it, got it working in our tool flow, tool flow within a couple of days. And so it seemed pretty straightforward. And we thought it would be pretty straightforward to integrate for that reason. Uh, the solder pad license it was offered under, um, we weren't familiar with it at the time. Uh, we vetted it with some of our counsel, and there were no gotchas. Um, at the time, there was some language about an attribution notice, but we didn't see that completely unreasonable at the time. Finally, um, this came down to the main sticking point between going with Risky or going with Bottle Rocket. Um, it was implemented in System Verilog instead of Chisel. And I've listed a few data points here. I, I don't want to get too far into it. But essentially, the, for us, the System Verilog builds on an established physical design and verification flow. And we didn't want to muck with that at the time. Uh, another issue we've run into in the past when we're using Chisel and other designs, as well as Rocket Chip, is the Chisel generated Verilog loses the designer's intent, making it difficult to read and debug. And finally, the Chisel generated code makes certain physical design items difficult, such as sync, async re clocks, resets, uh, multiple power domains, multiple clock domains, and so forth. So since we chose to continue with our evaluation of Risky, um, we provide some experience of, on, on, our, you know, on our evaluation. So we've separated into three categories. The good, um, these are things that made it possible, that, that made it straightforward. Um, the RTL, um, a majority of our team members thought it was of good, good, good quality. It was, it, was, it, was, it was good enough. Um, working with the ETH and Pulp team, they've been very responsive, um, easy to work with, and very eager to help us out or provide any directions or help with us any questions we came, with, we came up with along the way. Uh, the core comes with some debug capability out of the box. Um, a lot of this was implemented before the debug spec, spec was there, so it's not you know, compliant with the spec, but it's there and it, it works. Um, we were able to work with a consultant Valtrix uh, systems out of, that had a tool called Sting. 
And we used Sting to generate some instructions to verify the core against the RV32 IMC ISA. And uh, we had some good coverage numbers that we had in a poster session last night. And finally, the documentation that Risky came with was clear enough and concise enough that it made integrating pretty straightforward. The BAB, these are things that you know, you, you know you're going to come upon when you're integrating something like this. And we were able to you know, work with them and, and address the issues. Um, there were new, we, we, we took the RTL for Risky and ran it against our internal lint deck, which is quite rigorous, to be honest. But um, the one thing to note here is I think, in general, we need to make sure that these open source cores have some level of lint run against them um, to make it easier to move into different commercial environments. Uh, next, it, was, it had some simulation and some, some tests that associated with the Pulp platform, but they were kind of ad hoc. They were targeted towards their, their use cases in DSP and whatnot. We found some bugs through our, our, you know, our efforts with Valtrex, uh, some with the, the Pulpino specific compiler for their extensions. Um, so there was some documentation inconsistencies. And we found some bugs in the extensions. You know, we've all fed these back to ETH. They've addressed just about all of them. Um, so it was a good exercise. The other thing is the debug spec, while it's there, it requires some specific utilities because it's not in line with the, the specification. Um, moving forward, it'd be good if we get a debugger that was up to spec so we could take an off-the-shelf debugger from Lauterbach or something and, and plug it in. It would make our software guys really happy. Uh, the ugly, these are things that were kind of jaw-dropping that, that scared us a little bit. Um, version control, um, we've since addressed this with, with Pulpino, but the beauty of working with Valtrex is we didn't have to provide them on RTL. We could just give them a git hash and say, go, can you start testing this core? Well, when you give them a git hash, you assume you're going to get a certain version of RTL, and there's a script that runs underneath the hood and goes and grabs something from the top of the tree. And we were able to address it and fix it, but there was a moment where we all had to take a gasp. Um, we found a few bugs that violated the, the compliance with the, with the ISA and, and, and the multiplier and the load store unit. Again, I want to give kudos to the pulp guys. They were right on it. We, we told them what the issue is, and they provided us patches within a couple of days. Uh, so recap and kind of next steps. Where have we been? So I went through and described um, the Pixel Visual 4 configuration mechanism and, and where in our evaluation that the RISC-V core fit in. Um, we continued the evaluation with the RISC-E core and uh, share some of our experience of you know, integrating that open source IP and, and some things we came across. Where we'd like to go from here, um, we see there's a lot of application space for a risky type core that is fully compliant with the privilege and debug spec and has been you know, verified. Um, and after we've added and integrated the risky core, we're looking to measure the performance increase from the pixel visual and core configuration space. So that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. How much of a role do things like bus interfaces play in your evaluation? Or are they not, not particularly interesting questions? Uh, no, we were able to, you know, you're talking about the interface to the core? Yeah, yeah. the rest of whatever it's connecting. Um, so the pulp platform comes with some Axie infrastructure, and so that was fairly standardized. Um, if you look at it, though, we, we, we did find some issues in there that we addressed with them, but is that the best interfaces you're talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, the, their interface to the core is standardized, you know, AMBA Axie stuff. And that's what you were looking for. And that's what you were looking for. Yeah, that's, it certainly helped, yeah.